Okay, thank you, Beth and Alexis, for the invitation to be here. You'll probably recognize the diagram on the left. I couldn't resist putting it up because that's probably, as an oceanographer, that diagram, more than anything else, is what lured me into astrobiology about 15 years ago. And what I'm going to talk about today is a new P-Star program we just kicked off last year of, of the current best efforts amongst the uh, combined ocean and, and planetary science uh, team, from mostly from Woods Hole and JPL, of actually how to try and convert a nice idea into what's the current state of the art of how would you actually go and do that kind of thing if you wanted to go to an ice covered ocean and study it. Uh, so this is work funded by NASA, but the robot that we're actually using wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't actually had NSF pay for it and NOAA fund us to learn how to use it without losing it and breaking it. So here's the concept. Basically what we wanted to do for, for our own oceans, which are interesting for their own right, even without the astrobiological uh, credentials, would be if you actually want to go study something in detail on the seafloor in the Arctic Ocean, you can wait till everything freezes over like we did in September and October of last year and you get 100% ice cover. But the trouble is the ship then becomes stationary compared to the ice, but both the ship and the ice are still continuously moving compared to the solid um, shell of the Earth underneath. So if there's a particular place on the Earth on the seafloor that you want to go and study in detail, you can't actually hang around there for hours at a time if everything above you is moving at a mile or two an hour. But basically, by the end of the day, you're, um, you're some tens of kilometers away from where you need to be. So that was the vision we had, was to have a vehicle that you can actually deploy under the ice, and it can actually be free swimming um, in autonomous mode, but it could also be something where you can actually keep humans in the loop for the most detailed stuff you want to do. And we do that by using a single optical fiber, about twice the thickness of a human hair, where about 20 kilometers worth of that tether can be rolled up in something the size of a large roll of duct tape. So basically, what it allows you to do is to complete keep all the communication with the vehicle. It's basically a battery powered vehicle, so it can basically keep going as long as the batteries last, um, and the ship can actually go wherever you like. The only key thing then is somehow the ship and the vehicle have to meet up again at the end of the day. So the place we took it to was to um, 87 degrees north in the Arctic, about 200 miles south of the North Pole uh, last September and October. And in particular, we went to this area. So here's the Gackle Ridge, which is a mid-ocean ridge, which can host hydrothermal activity. And there'd been chemical indication that there were such things in this area. The vehicle we had in its first version has only been developed to go to 2,000 meters because it wasn't really designed for doing seafloor hydrothermal exploration. Um, but the area we went to here was this inside corner high because based on the bathymetric maps, it was the closest thing we had to the kind of geologic setting for the Lost City hydrothermal field, if you know about it, or the Von Damme hydrothermal field, so places where you can have tectonically hosted and, and serpentinizing, serpentinizing or serpentinization influenced hydrothermal systems on the sea floor. So our hope was that we could go up to this area, search for the right chemical signals in this area in autonomous mode, track down sources to the sea floor, and uh, go find you know, serpentinizing related uh, ecosystems on the seafloor we could study with the vehicle. So we went to this area, here's that summit in detail, here's where we went and did AUV based mapping, here's what 100% ice cover looks like, so the cartoon before, we've made that part real already. Um, there's the ship as filmed from the helicopter in the first month before the sun went down, and we could actually still fly the helicopter. And when we got there, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, we did find an oasis for life, but it had nothing to do with serpentinizing fluid flow. So uh, a phrase I picked up from the Europa Lander Town Hall on Sunday was, there was nothing wrong with the technology here, just like the Viking mission. It wasn't our fault that nature conspired not to put the right stuff in front of the vehicle while we were there. <laughs> that where we went to was the only place that was shallow enough for this vehicle to work on currently. And this is the place that was teeming with life, but it wasn't actually teeming with serpentinizing seafloor fluid flow. What it actually had instead was the whole area. We couldn't actually find any rock in our camera surveys all we could actually find were these giant sponges, the large ones here about a meter across. So it's basically a continuous spectrum from tiny little baby giant sponges to fully grown giant sponges to the matrix in between, which was actually the mush left behind when giant sponges had fallen apart. So there was actually no rock outcrop in some thousands and thousands of photographs. What we actually had instead was we did actually find little whiffs every now and then on our redox sensor that was suggesting there was something chemosynthetic in the area, nothing that was indicative of fluid flow, but instead what we found was, sorry, I went, let me go back one. Ah, need to go back two. What we found were in these sponges, because they were extensive over 10 miles or so, that there was at least a subset of them that were basically rotting away on the seafloor. And so you actually had these things, so we actually have these 
these mats of microbial filament that animals were gathering around, and when you zoom in on them, we actually could actually film these things with these shrimp actually grazing on the microbial filaments. So we had a nice little chemosynthetic food chain at the bottom of an ice-covered ocean, so that's all great, but it's got nothing to do with serpentinization, so I should move on. <laughs> so we had a plan B, we had a fallback, which was, here's the seamount we were working on where we were just seeming that stuff. Oh, and interestingly, in my mind, while I was filming that stuff, I was zooming in and doing all this detail, and it was only afterwards somebody pointed out that at the time I was doing that, I was actually three miles away and drifting backwards away from the vent site. That where the ship was that was doing all that stuff was a long way away. And at the end of the sequence, there was a time we had to pick up the ROV and, and skedaddle to catch back up with the ship and come back home. But, button trouble. Plan B for the program was actually that there was another volcanic ridge down here at about 3,500 meters on the axis of the Rift Valley that we could go and study. We couldn't do it with the ROV. We could go back to what I started out my career doing 30 years ago, and I thought I'd given up forever, which was lowering conventional CTD rosettes. These are basically instrument packages you lower on a wire directly below the ship. It has in situ sensors that can tell you something about the chemistry of the water column. That can tell you where to take your water samples from. And in a normal ocean, that's great. In an ice covered ocean, you have this problem that basically where you get your samples from is then at the mercy of the elements of exactly where the ship and the ice move to and where the wind changes. So we knew we had this volcanic target here, and over time and perseverance and some good judgment and some bad judgment, then some of the time we actually got data in the area we wanted to, and in fact we were actually able to narrow down exactly where the venting must be coming from, from this volcanic ridge at 3,500 meters, to the level where we actually were able to intercept the rising stem of the plume coming above the source. So we probably know where the site is to about 100 meters or so. So we don't have pretty pictures of what's living down there at that second site, but what we do have is a lot of chemical information about what the source function must be, or what the source system must be like. And the first thing that got us excited is we were doing shipboard chemical analyses, and we found there were very high methane concentrations in these systems. So we weren't expecting that because we had some camera toes over the area as well. All we saw was a basalt-hosted volcanic ridge. So we were expecting this to be very boring. I was expecting not to have anything interesting enough for this session from the second half of what we did on our cruise. Instead, we found these very high hydrogen uh, methane concentrations and then what we also found was that for the highest concentration samples, we also had very high hydrogen concentrations as well, and in about a one-to-one -one ratio. And it's only as you travel further away in the plume, which is probably only the order of a kilometre or so, then you get very rapid removal of the hydrogen. The hydrogen doesn't persist in the water column. The methane does, so you get this nice linear correlation with the temperature anomaly, so the temperature is a nice conservative physical tracer. Over the period of what we would imagine to be days and kilometres for the dispersion of this plume, so basically the sample t taken throughout the survey area all compiled onto a single plot. The methane is relatively sluggishly and unreactive. The hydrogen, by um, contrast, is much more reactive. And in fact, we've actually had some, Antia Botius is a collaborator on here. Her group in the Alfred Wegener Institute have been doing microbial incubation experiments, and they have good evidence that these are actually, it's hydrogen, there are hydrogen oxidizing or hydrogen consuming microbes in these plume waters that we collected. And that's actually what's responsible for it. It's not an inorganic process, it's a microbially mediated removal of the, the hydrogen. So that's pretty cool. So we think we've got a hydrogen-rich, methane-rich hydrothermal vent on the seafloor. The other thing we realized by looking at the in-situ sensors, however, is it's not a conventional black smoker, high-temperature hydrothermal field. As we got very close to the source, we found our redox anomalies where we had the freshest samples right over the source were actually relatively low in particulate material. So we had material that was fairly low in particulate concentration, and as the plume dispersed further afield, the particulate concentrations increased and they grew in. So we actually have some of that particulate material, we're still working on it. There are two mechanisms we can imagine of how that worked. One is that it could be the microbial activity, and what you're actually doing is increasing microbial cell abundance, but these are over very short length scales of a kilometer and probably not much time. The other thing that I think is more plausible is we have a system that's not very rich in hydrogen sulfide, but it is rich in iron, which would fit with other sites we've found that have high hydrogen and high methane on the seafloor. And that that iron, the oxidation, because the Arctic is a fairly isolated ocean basin and quite sluggish, that the rates of iron oxidation, the kinetics, are quite slow. So the time it takes for an hour or so for the material to get from the seafloor up into the plume height in this area is only the order of an hour or so. The iron oxidation kinetics may well be that the iron is then growing in. So what I'd like to do now is just ask you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine what a vent site like that would look like. So I want you to imagine a hot vent site at the bottom of the seafloor that's buoyant enough to kick a plume up into the water column, but it's got clear fluids when it comes out the seafloor. And if you open your eyes, here's what you imagined. Well done. You made it happen. You made it true. So this is actually the Von Damme hydrothermal field from the Mid-Cayman Rise, which I actually very um, 
I can't often believe when, well, actually, I never really believe it when my proposals come true, but back in the mid-2000s, I actually wrote a proposal saying I wanted to go to the Cayman Rise because it would be great preparation for the Arctic, because it's the one place where we could go and do everything else that we'd expect to find in the Arctic, apart from have the ice in the way. And so we found this site, the Von Dam Hydrothermal Field, which is pretty cool because that was the work that Jill McDermott did for her PhD with Jeff Seward and me was on those samples, was proving there were two different pathways for abiotic organic synthesis that you could actually get out of that system. So it's a hybrid system with ultramafic rocks, but also some gabroic material in there as well, which gives you both energy and a bit of extra silica that you wouldn't have from a purely serpentinizing system. So you might think of that as being a really cool place. So do I think that's what's happening on the bottom of the Arctic? No, sadly not. That site is actually set right up on an ultramafic hilltop. So the Von Damme hydrothermal field is actually sitting in a system just like the Karasik seamount we first went to, the one that was a bus that just had all those sponges and no fluid flow. So in fact, what we've actually found is something that's sitting much more like these systems down on volcanic ridges in the middle of the Arctic Rift Valley. So now we have a deep basaltic hosted system that's basically generating another kind of fluid flow, which is also interesting. So I think that's really where I want to end, is my take home message is, when you're thinking about where might be interesting in the, elsewhere in the solar system, try not to get too prejudiced by the most recent discovery somebody showed you recently from the Earth's seafloor. Because every time I go out and find new things, I find even more new, cool, interesting things that were not the things I was looking for, that I stumble upon. And I'm, you know, at least I'm smart enough or I hang out with you guys enough to actually recognize when they're interesting. But, but the idea that we've explored all the geologic diversity there is on our planet, you know, basically uh, the, an exploration is not the way to do it, but the, the thoughtfulness that would, can arise, can be stimulated by this, is probably the way to go is, is let's anticipate there's the same kind of geologic diversity elsewhere in the solar system um, and then uh, get ready for more surprises. Thank you. <laughs>